Hey, what's up guys? Brian Kelly here from Zombie Guitar. Here in this video, I just want to talk about the On The Turning Away solo. So I just learned this solo this week. This has been one of my longtime favorites by my probably favorite guitar player of all time, David Gilmour. I just learned it this week and I uh, posted a uh, demo on YouTube. If you want to check out that demo, I'll post a link to that below. In this video, I just want to talk about what makes this solo awesome. So there's four things in particular. And that's what we're going to talk about. Before we dive into those four things, I just want to talk about the tone that I used for my demo. People were asking me about my tone. So I really didn't do anything special. I just always use the uh, Amp Sim software called S Gear for every single YouTube video that I've ever made in the last like two years or something like that. They've all been done just plugging directly into my computer. It's not expensive software. It's only a one-time fee. I'm not sponsored by them. I'm not endorsed by them. I'm just letting you know that I use it and it's a great software. And then inside of the S gear program, I just chose a preset. So the preset I chose was called Wayfair Heaven Drive. It's just one of the presets that comes with the software. And that's it. That's all I did. So this is what the tone sounds like. Here's just like open chords. It's pretty heavy on the distortion, you know, but It's got a lot of delay, a lot of reverb, but that's all I did. I just plugged into the computer, opened up S gear, chose that preset, and that's my tone. So let's get into the four things that make this solo awesome. So the first thing is the chord progression. So a lot of times when you hear a solo that you really, really like, a, a large part of the reason that you like the sound of that particular solo is because the chord progression is doing something that your ears like. Not to take away from the solo part of it, but really the underlying chords are the driver of the bus. This song just uses four super common chords. It uses an E minor, a G major, a C major, a D major. Everything's right in the same key. This is in the key of G major. You could also say this is in the key of E minor. So there's like a million songs that use these four chords, but... For some reason, if you play this particular chord sequence that's used in this song, it just sounds exactly like On the Turning Away. You don't need all the solo stuff over top of it. You just play these four chords in this exact sequence, and you're going to be like, oh, that's Pink Floyd. I know that song. So let me just quickly run through the progression while counting along so you can hear what I'm talking about. So the chord progression goes like this. One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four, two, three, four. Five, two, three, four, six, two, three, four, seven, two, three, four, eight, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and then it loops back over. So thousands of songs have used E minor, G major, D major, and C major together, but only Pink Floyd has managed to put those four chords together in an eight bar sequence in this exact way, you know? And as a result, it's on the turning away. So the chord progression underneath is always going to be a large portion of the reason as to why you like a particular solo. The second reason that this is such an awesome solo is because it sticks to absolute bare bones fundamental stuff. And this is true for a lot of Pink Floyd songs. A lot of Pink Floyd songs are just bare bones, basic, one single key, nothing fancy, nothing complicated not using a million scales or anything like that. It's just, here's the chords. These chords put us in this one single key. David Gilmour, the lead guitar player, is like, okay, we're in the key of G major. All right, that's my scale. I'm going to use the G major scale the entire time for the entire solo. And that's it. That's the process for almost every Pink Floyd solo. You could also say that the scale that Gilmour was using the entire time was the E natural minor scale because the seven notes of the G major scale are the same seven notes as the E natural minor scale. So if you map out those seven notes across the entire fretboard, that's the soloing framework that Gilmore uses the entire time. And that's it. From a scale point of view, that's all it is. You don't need to switch scales over each chord. You don't need to play anything exotic. You don't need anything fancy. It's just what key are we in? That's my scale. Done. But then within that seven note scale that is used the entire time throughout the entire solo, certain notes are going to sound better over each of the chords. Over the E minor chord, which consists of the notes E, G, and B, the notes E, G, or B are probably going to be the best sounding notes within your key scale to kind of sustain on. And then over the G major chord, which consists of the notes G, B, and D, those are probably going to be the best sounding notes to sustain on as the G major chord is occurring in the rhythm section. Same thing for the C major chord, same thing for the D major chord. He's still not switching scales. He's just focusing on specific notes within the scale 
as the chords are changing. That is what chord tone targeting is. So let's just kind of break this down a little bit further. Let's first just look at the entire G major slash E natural minor scale across the entire fretboard, break it down to specifically which positions Gilmore is using, and then just look at a couple examples of where chord tone targeting is being used. So here we've mapped out these seven notes of the key scale. These are the notes G, A, B, C, D, E, and F sharp. That's all that is used for this entire solo. So when you map out the entire key scale across the entire fretboard of the guitar, it looks like a big, giant, complicated matrix of notes that for a newer guitar player, they look at it like, I got, I, am I ever going to be able to do this? This looks almost impossible. How am I supposed to do anything with that crazy, complicated matrix of notes? Fortunately, the cool thing about the guitar is that every single key shares the same patterns. It's just a shift. It's like the big giant pattern that you just saw for the key of G major slash E minor is exactly the same pattern for every other key. It's just kind of moved around like this. So as guitar players, we want to identify positions. And the two, I'm going to say, most common positions that you're going to see come up all the time in like every solo that you ever hear, pentatonic position number one, pentatonic position number four. And that's pretty much all that's being used in this solo. So let's kind of look at this matrix of notes and we're just going to whittle it down to those two positions. So pentatonic position number one is found right here between frets 12 and 15 for this key. Pentatonic position number one can also be found down here between open and three. So that's where you can find pentatonic position number one for this key. You can find it there. You can find it there. <laughs> All right, so your pentatonic position number one for this key is here and here. That pattern is going to be the same regardless of what key you're playing in. It's just that depending on what key you're playing in, your pentatonic position number one is going to be found in a different location of the fretboard. And then the other thing to keep in mind is that the pentatonic scale is just five notes and the full key scale, otherwise known as the diatonic scale, is seven notes. So the notes that are in yellow are going to be your pentatonic notes, and then the black notes that you see, those are going to be the two additional notes that create the full diatonic scale. Pentatonic position number four for this key is going to be right here between frets seven and ten. <laughs> Pentatonic position number four is also going to be found up here between frets 19 and 22. Again, the same thing is true for pentatonic position number four. You can choose to just play the pentatonic notes or you can choose to play the full seven note key scale. So Gilmore sticks to just those two positions for the entire solo. So as far as the scale stuff, as far as the key information stuff goes, that's all there is involved. That's what I refer to as layer one. On the entire Zombie Guitar website, whenever we're talking about these positions and what key you're in, not paying attention to the chords yet, that's what I refer to as layer one. Let's now dive into layer two. This is where Dave Gilmore says, okay, cool, I'm, I got my pentatonic positions, I know what key I'm in, and now it's time to start paying attention to those chords that I'm soloing over. This is the chord tone targeting part. This is the layer two. This is where you pay attention to specific notes within the scale that you're using on a per chord basis. All right, so I'm not gonna go through the entire solo and point out every single note that was played and be like, yep, there it's chord tone targeting, yep, that one's chord tone targeting, yep, that one's chord tone targeting, because it's like the entire solo, you know? Um, I'm just gonna show you two examples of how common this chord tone targeting stuff is, how simple it is, and how it's just everywhere. Chord tone targeting is everywhere. So the two examples I wanna show you occur right here in pentatonic position number four. Now remember, it doesn't matter what key you're in, you could be in any key, your pentatonic position number four is always going to have the same pattern to it, the same shape. The fact that we're in the key of G major slash E minor, that just puts our pentatonic position number four right here between frets seven and ten, or your pentatonic position number four is up here as well for this key. So your pentatonic position number four is going to move around depending on what key you're in, but you only have to memorize that pattern one single time. You just have to know how to locate that pattern depending on which key you're in. And just a quick reminder to do that, you just need to know where your major and minor scale roots are located on your A string. So for the key of E minor, G major, 
Here's your E right there on the seventh fret. Here's your G right there on the tenth fret. Index is where your minor scale root goes. Pinky is where your major scale root goes. So that's how you locate your pentatonic position number four based on the key information. So just a little side note there. Anyway, so chord tone targeting in pentatonic position number four, the two examples I wanna show you. The first thing he does is he goes like this. That's played over a D major to a G major. You see how those two things I just played sounded exactly the same? That's because right here, this was a D major chord. And this is a G chord. So it was only two notes being used, but you can take this information and you can apply it to any key that you want. Because your pentatonic position number four is always going to have the same pattern. The way that you can take this information and apply it to any key that you want is by saying, all right, I'm not going to say that this is a D major to a G major anymore. I'm instead going to say that this is a five chord and this is a one chord. That's the thing that connects all of the keys together. Numbering your chords as opposed to calling them by their actual chord names, that's what connects all of the keys together. So in the key that we're in, which is the key of G major, your one chord is G major, your two chord is A minor, your three chord is B minor, four chord is C major, five chord is D major, six chord is E minor, seven chord is F sharp diminished. So in this key, D major is your five chord, G major is your one chord. So just think of this as a 5-1 movement. It doesn't matter what key you're playing in, you're going to see 5-1 movements coming up all the time. Like there could be a song that's in the key of B minor or D major. There's going to be a 5-1 movement in that song probably. Or if the song's in the key of whatever, B major, G sharp minor, there's probably going to be a 5-1 movement in that song too, you know? Locate your pentatonic position number four, recognize that this is five and this is one. Boom, chord tone targeting. Now, anytime you play a song for the rest of your entire life and you recognize, oh, that's a 5-1 chord movement, you can always steal this little lick. No one's going to know that you stole it from on the turning away. You can just be noodling, oh, 5-5-1. Five, five, All right, so that's how simple chord tone targeting is. So that's the first example I wanted to give. The second example I wanted to give right here is right at the point where it switches, the E minor chord is played for its six bars or whatever, and it's doing something like. All right, so it went from an E minor to the D major to the G major, that part of the rhythm section. So instead of thinking of it as E minor, D major, G major, think of it as a six chord, five chord, one chord, because that's going to be the thing that allows you to move from key to key to key to key. So right there in pentatonic position number four, at the very end of the solo, he does this beautiful run. It just gives me the chills. Every time I hear it, it's just so nice. So over the E minor chord, he's bending this note right here. So when you bend that note, the 10th fret of the B string, you're achieving this pitch. You bend that by a full step. You achieve this pitch. That's the note B. That's going to sound great over an E minor chord because the notes are E, G, and B. It's your chord tone targeting there. You then come down. So right there, seventh note of the B string, that's the note F sharp. That's played over the D major chord. And then it moves up to this note right here, which is the note G, and that's played over the G major chord. Now again, instead of thinking that as E minor, D major, G major, and thinking of the specific notes that you just played to connect your lead to the rhythm section, you could just think, oh, that was a six to a five to a one. Anytime you have a six to a five to a one in any song ever, and you know where your pentatonic position number four is, you always know that bending this note is gonna achieve a chord tone of the six chord, coming down to here is gonna achieve a chord tone of the five chord, and then moving up one half step, or one fret is going to achieve a chord tone of the one chord. So this information is now transferable to any key that you play on, assuming that you know where your pentatonic position number four is, and assuming that you know how to number your chords. So that's chord tone targeting in a nutshell. So the third thing that makes this solo awesome is the fact that Gilmore is not just chord tone targeting, I mean, we all know that chord tone targeting sounds awesome, and that's the reason that specific notes sound great within the scale. 
the thing that really kind of makes this solo have its signature sound, in my opinion at least, is the fact that Gilmore is choosing to target fifths a lot. So let's just talk about what chord tone targeting is, because I know you already know this, I just got done talking about it for a while, but questions come up about what constitutes a chord tone. So when I say chord tone targeting, I'm always talking about the triad portion of the underlying chord. Like, if the underlying chord in the rhythm section is an E minor 9 chord, for example, an E minor 9 chord consists of five notes, all five of those notes are technically chord tones. So what makes up that chord is the triad portion, the seventh, and then the extension. Now, when I talk about chord tone targeting, I'm only talking about the triad portion. That's the strongest tones of the chord, all right? So when I talk about chord tone targeting, it's roots, thirds, and fifths. You can play sevenths over the chord and it's going to sound nice, but it's not going to be as strong as a root third or fifth. That's the chord tones. That is chord tone targeting. Triads are everything. I made a whole video about triads and the importance of triads. And people are always like, oh, do you have any lessons on triads? Yes, every single lesson I've ever made is about triads. Everything. Triads is everything. So chord tone targeting is about roots, thirds, and fifths. So when you take this chord tone targeting thing to the next level and you start paying attention to the specific chord tones that you are sustaining on, the way that I kind of define this stuff is roots are, they sound great. You know, if you play an E over an E minor chord, it's going to sound awesome. If you play a G over a G major chord, it's going to sound awesome. If you play a C over a C major chord, it's going to sound awesome. Roots just work. They always work. Thirds are beautiful, pretty, melodic. That's the way that I hear them. So if you're playing over an E minor chord and you target the note G, which is the third of an E minor chord, that G is just going to sound beautiful, melodic, pretty. It's going to sound great, but it's going to sound a different type of great than that root. Fifths are also going to sound cool. They're going to sound great. They're going to connect with the underlying chord. But there's like a certain darkness to fifths. At least this is the way that I hear it. The notes that he's choosing to chord tone target happen to be fifths a lot. And it results in this just like, I don't know, man. It, it sounds great. It gives me the chills. It sounds awesome. Everything's connected with the underlying chords. But the fact that he's choosing to chord tone target fifths, I'm just like, ooh, man. Dave Gilmore, why'd you do that, man? It's a... Fifths are cool, man. Anyway, so... Uh... Let's just look at a couple instances of where that actually occurs. It occurs right in the very beginning. So, you know, the solo starts out. Right there, that's the note B. That's being played over the E minor chord, E, G, B. So fifth targeting is right there. Second time around. Right there, that's the note D. That's being played over G major chord, G, B, D. So, uh, yeah, that's a fifth right there. And you'll hear that he comes back to this B right here on the 12th fret of the B string. He comes to that a lot over the E minor chord just because, I don't know, he's like, that, he's, that's the sound of the on the turning away solo. So you're just going to hear that predominantly occurring a lot. It also happens down here when he does this thing. kind of sustaining on that B right there over the E minor chord, again, resulting in that dark sound of the fifth. It, it happens a lot. You know, again, I'm not going to go through the entire solo and point out every single instance of the fifth, but, you know, just kind of go through it and just be like, what? Okay, there's a chord tone. Okay, it's connecting with that chord. All right, is it the root third of the fifth? And then you're going to find out that a lot of the times the chord tone that Gilmore's choosing to sustain on in the solo, a lot of times it's the fifth. So that just gives it like its signature sort of dark quality to it. I don't know. That's my take on it. Fifths are awesome. So the fourth thing that makes this solo awesome, and this is every Pink Floyd solo, is the feel component. Now, feel is just something that does not come naturally to me. It never came naturally to me. It wasn't even something that was on my radar at all for like my first 20 years of playing. My first 20 years of guitar playing, I was focused on playing the right notes, knowing the notes that I was playing, learning music theory, um, making sure that my timing was on and stuff like that. But there's this whole other side that I was not aware of. It wasn't until I, until my recent drummer of my old band, 
the latest drummer of my old band, who is a phenomenal guitar player, came along, and he explained this whole feel thing to me. He doesn't care about music theory. He doesn't write his own music. He doesn't play his own stuff. He only plays other people's songs. That's all he does. But he plays them amazingly, and he plays them with this amazing feel. So when he plays like a Led Zeppelin solo or something like that, I watch him. I'm like, wow, you're so good, dude. How are you so good, you know? Like, you're just, I could play that solo too, but you just do it so much better. What are you doing? He's like, it's because I'm playing with feel, dude. You're not, you don't play with good feel. Bro. Sup, bro. Our sound guy is my favorite guitar player in the world. Oh, why do you say that? Because his feel is amazing. What is this feel that you speak of? I can't explain it. You either have it, or you don't. Do I have good feel? Well, you are a really nice guy, and you have a lot of great qualities. So you are saying, that I do not have good feel? How about those eagles? I am just going to sell all my gear, and take up stamp collecting. Hey! I just bought a new compressor. What brings you here today? Well, I am quitting guitar. Why? Because I don't have any feel. Dude! Feel is something that can be developed over time. Wow! Really? Yes! Feel is about locking in with the rhythm section. But I can already do that. Sure! But it applies to all aspects of your playing, including vibrato. Huh? Yes. The key to vibrato is to lock it in with the rhythm. This can be developed through metronome training. I will not quit playing guitar. I will instead start a YouTube channel where I teach music theory. So this is actually something that the old sound guy of my band taught me who is also a very great guitar player who has amazing feel. But he approaches feel from a mathematical point of view, kind of like I do. So he explained it to me. He's like, dude, when you do vibrato, he's like, you have to know the pitch that you're bending to and then be consistent with that. And then you also have to time your vibrato so it matches up with the tempo of the song. So if the song is going one, two, three, four, subdivisions could be eighth notes. They could be one and two and three and four and, or they could be something like sixteenth notes, like one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a, or even triplets, like one two three, one two three, one two three, one two three. He's like just match it up with the tempo of the song, some sort of subdivision, whether it's eighth notes or triplets or sixteenth notes or whatever, and then make sure you're achieving the correct pitch so if i'm going to bend if i'm going to do vibrato on this note right here i might want to bend such that i achieve this pitch all right or i might want to bend so i achieve this pitch so there's that but then there's the speed component so if the tempo of the song is one two three four I may do vibrato that's 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and so. Or 1 e and a 2 e and a 3 e and a 4 e and a. So that's how I'm thinking. That's This was taught to me by my sound guy. I'm not feeling that. I'm just I'm, I'm engineering my way through this stuff by using the tempo of the song and the, the distance that I'm bending the note to. I do that. And I did that for this whole solo. So right there, I actually was doing it with the whammy bar instead of, you know, doing vibrato bends. But you could see that it was kind of timed with the rhythm. So that's kind of how I engineer my way through feeling vibrato. I don't just feel the vibrato. I count the vibrato. I count the tempo and I try to, you know, see what note I'm bending to. In the heat of the moment, in the situation, a lot of times I forget to do that stuff and I just kind of just go... You know, and it's like not related to the tempo of the music whatsoever. No feel whatsoever. Horrible vibrato. 
sorry. Um, but when I am actually, you know, thinking about it and methodically approaching the vibrato, it sounds a little better. It just doesn't come naturally to me. The other thing is how long to sustain the notes for. Like this song consists of a lot of very long sustained notes. You know, like how long do I sustain that note before coming down? Again, I would count. I would see what the actual song does, and I would say, okay, he, one, two, three, oh, okay, right there, that's where he makes the switch. So as I'm practicing the solo and sustaining these notes, every time I get to a part of the solo, I'm like, okay, two, three, and then I practice it that way, you know? One sustained note at a time. One sustained note, one sustained note, you know? So I literally have to engineer my way through a song to try and make it sound like I have good feel. So yeah, so that's how I personally approach anything pertaining to this whole feel component. But at least, you know, if I can count tempos and then I can subdivide tempos and then I can look at how far notes are being bent to the specific pitch they're being bent, then I can tell myself exactly what I need to practice and then I practice it that exact way and then I can get it down that exact way and then I can mimic feel. So I don't know, is that what feel is? Can you math your way through feel or does it have to flow out of you naturally without thinking about it? I don't know. All I know is that the second way is not me. I need graphs. I need charts. I need math. I'm a nerd. That's just how my brain works. That's feel for me. All right. So anyway, so that's the fourth component of what makes this solo and every other Pink Floyd solo awesome is just Gilmore's phenomenal feel. Is he naturally doing this feel or is he thinking his way through the feel like I do? I don't know. All I know is the end result is a phenomenal sounding solo with what everyone would universally agree has great feel to it. So that's the fourth component. So those are the four things that I think that makes this solo awesome. Thank you guys for watching. Any questions or comments, feel free to ask. See you next time.